Myth is the foundation of life. It is the timeless pattern, the pious formula, into which life flows when it reproduces its traits out of the unconscious. Her fiery femininity triumphed over the eczema covering half her face. Hans! Love! Love! What is it, exactly? The word lacks definition. What one man has, the other loves, as the German proverb puts it. A solitary, and used to speaking of what he sees and feels, has mental experiences which are at once more intense and less articulate than those of a gregarious man. They are sluggish, yet more wayward, and never without a melancholy tinge. Sights and impressions which others brush aside with a glance, a light comment, a smile, occupy him more than their due. They sink silently in, they take on meaning, they become experience, emotion, adventure. Solitude gives birth to the original in us, to beauty unfamiliar and perilous to poetry. But also, it gives birth to the opposite, to the perverse, the illicit, the absurd. To feel stirring within you the wonderful and melancholy play of strange forces and to be aware that those others you yearn for are blithely inaccessible to all that moves you what a pain is this. And yet! He stood there aloof and alone, staring hopelessly at a drawn blind and making, in his distraction, as though he could look out. But yet he was happy. For he lived. His heart was full. It is love, not reason, that is stronger than death. People, after all, only love and respect other people so long as they remain unable to judge them. Longing is a child of ignorance. For happiness, he told himself, isn't being loved. That was just a slightly nauseous satisfaction of vanity. Happiness is loving and perhaps seizing a few short illusory moments of intimacy with the object of one's love. Hidden away amongst Ashenbach's writing was a passage directly asserting that nearly all the great things that exist owe their existence to a defiant despite. It is despite grief and anguish, despite poverty, loneliness, bodily weakness, vice and passion and a thousand inhibitions, that they have come into being at all. But this was more than an observation, it was an experience, it was positively the formula of his life and his fame, the key to his work. What was life? Was it perhaps only an infectious disease of matter, just as the so-called spontaneous generation of matter was perhaps only an illness, a cancerous stimulation of the immaterial? The first step toward evil, toward lust and death, was doubtless taken when, as the result of a tickle by some unknown incursion, spirit increased in density for the first time creating a pathologically rank growth of tissue that formed, half in pleasure, half in defense, as the prelude to matter, the transition from the immaterial to the material. How it must be when one is finally free of all the pressures honor brings and one can endlessly enjoy the unbounded advantages of disgrace and... Time drowns in the unmeasured monotony of space. Where uniformity reigns, movement from point to point is no longer movement, and where movement is no longer movement, there is no time. Death was a blessing, so great, so deep that we can fathom it only at those moments, 
like this one now, when we are reprieved from it. It was the return home from long, unspeakably painful wanderings, the correction of a great error, the loosening of tormenting chains, the removal of barriers it set a horrible accident to rights again. But what is it to be an artist? Nothing shows up the general human dislike of thinking and man's innate craving to be comfortable better than his attitude to this question. When these worthy people are affected by a work of art, they humbly say that that sort of thing is a gift. And because in their innocence they assume that beautiful and uplifting results must have beautiful and uplifting causes, they never dream that the gift in question is a very dubious affair and rests upon extremely sinister foundations. Listen to this. I know a banker, gray-haired businessman, who has a gift for writing stories. He employs this gift in his idle hours, and some of his stories are of the first rank. But despite, I say, despite this excellent gift, his withers are by no means unrings. On the contrary, he has had to serve a prison sentence on anything but trifling crowns. Yes, it was actually first in prison that he became conscious of his gift and his experiences as a convict are the main theme in all his works. One might be rash enough to conclude that a man has to be at home in some kind of jail in order to become a poet. The fruit of solitude is originality, something daringly and disconcertingly beautiful, the poetic creation. But the fruit of solitude can also be the perverse, the disproportionate, the absurd, and the forbidden. Nearly all the great things that exist owe their existence to a defiant despite. It is despite grief and anguish, despite poverty, loneliness, bodily weakness, vice and passion and a thousand inhibitions, that they have come into being at all. Art's vital need for revolutionary progress and achievement of the new depends on the vehicle of the strongest subjective sense for what is hackneyed, for what has nothing more to say, for those standard, normal means that have now become impossible. Dot. Even the Pekin can forfeit popularity if tied to something intellectual. So long as we are, death is not, and when death is present, we are not. In other words, between death and us there is no rapport. It is something with which we have nothing to do, and only incidentally the world and nature. Like any lover, he desired to please, suffered agonies at the thought of failure. Mere knowledge of human psychology would in itself infallibly make us despondent if we were not cheered and kept alert by the satisfaction of expressing it. Nothing is uglier than a person who despises himself but who, out of cowardice and vanity, is eager to please because he wants to be liked. Nor was it, in my opinion, any different with the lawyer who, in his almost bootlicking self-belittlement, went beyond the bounds of personal dignity. He was capable of saying to a lady whom he wanted to escort to the table, Dear madam, I'm a revolting person, but would you do me the honor? And, with no talent for self-mockery, he would say it repulsively and in bittersweet torment. The ringing of bells, the surging and swelling of bell supra urbum above the whole city in its airs overfilled with sound. Bells, bells, they swing and sway, 
they wag and weave through their whole ark on their beams, in their seats, hundred-voiced, in Babylonish confusion. Slow and swift, blaring and booming, there is neither measure nor harmony. They talk all at once and all together. They break in even on themselves, on clang and clappers, and leave no times for the excited metal to din itself out. For like a pendulum, they are already back at the other edge, droning into its own droning, so that when echo so resounds, in T. E. Domini Speravi, it is uttering already B. Quorum Tectus Sun Piccata into its own midst. Not only so, but lesser bells tinkle clear. From smaller shrines, as though the mass boy might be touching the little bell of the host. If the years of youth are experienced slowly, while the later years of life hurtle past at an ever-increasing speed, it must be habit that causes it. We know full well that the insertion of new habits or the changing of old ones is the only way to preserve life to renew our sense of time, to rejuvenate, intensify, and retard our experience of time and thereby renew our sense of life itself. That is the reason for every change of scenery and air. I stand between two worlds. I am at home in neither, and I suffer in consequence. You artists call me a bourgeois, and the bourgeois try to arrest me. I don't know which makes me feel worse. Often I have thought of the day when I gazed for the first time at the sea. The sea is vast, the sea is wide, my eyes rove far and wide and long to be free. But there was the horizon. Why a horizon, when I wanted the infinite? From life? For an important intellectual product to be immediately weighty, a deep relationship or concordance has to exist between the life of its creator and the general lives of the people. These people are generally unaware why exactly they praise a certain work of art. Far from being truly knowledgeable, they perceive it to have a hundred different benefits to justify their adulation, but the real underlying reason for their behavior cannot be measured is sympathy. If I can contradict you at all, if I can defend your own profession a little against you, it is not by saying anything new, but simply by reminding you of some things you very well know yourself, of the purifying and healing influence of letters, the subduing of the passions by knowledge and eloquence, literature as the guide to understanding, forgiveness, and love, the redeeming power of the word, literary art as the noblest manifestation of the human mind. That language could but extol, not reproduce, the beauties of the sense. What our age needs, what it demands, what it will create for itself, is terror. A harmful truth is better than a useful lie. Nearly everything great owes its existence to despites, despite misery and affliction, poverty, desolation, physical debility, vice, passion, and a thousand other obstacles. The average man thinks that a little falseness goes with beauty. We come out of darkness and return to darkness with some experiences in between. But we don't experience the beginning and the end, birth and death. We are not subjectively aware of them. They exist only in the world of objective events, and that's that.
Only incorrigible bohemians find it boring or laughable when a man of talent outgrows the libertine chrysalis stage and begins to perceive and express the dignity of the intellect. Adopting the courtly ways of a solitude replete with bitter suffering and inner battles though eventually gaining a position of power and honor among men. Art is the funnel, as it were, through which spirit is poured into life. But he discovered that his thoughts and inspirations were like the intimations of a dream which always seem inspired at the time, but prove utterly shallow and useless to the waking mind. But then he came across a long chapter that he read from the first word to the last, with his lips tightly closed, his eyebrows pursed, concentrating, his face registering a total, almost death-like look of earnest concentration oblivious to every trace of life stirring around him. This chapter was entitled, Concerning Death and Its Relation to the Indestructibility of Our Essential Nature. This was love at first sight, love everlasting, a feeling unknown, unhoped for, Unexpected in so far as it could be a matter of conscious awareness, it took entire possession of him, and he understood, with joyous amazement, that this was for life. Life of service and humility, of silent subordination and religious training, from which he wrested intellectual pleasures congruent with his. One always needs to be reminded, one is by no means always in possession of one's whole self. Our consciousness is feeble, only in moments of unusual clarity and vision do we really know about ourselves. It's a craving that shouldn't even exist, and yet you can't wish it didn't exist. Once it is hold of you, you can't wish it away because you'd have to wish your life away. It's so bound up with it, and you can't do that. What good would dying do? Afterward, with pleasure. In her arms, only too gladly. But before? That's nonsense, because life is desire, and desire is life, and life can't be its own enemy. How good, he thinks, that she breathes in oblivion with every breath she draws. That in childhood each night is a deep wide gulf between one day and the next. Has he really insulted me? But an insult must be of intent, otherwise it can be none. For the sake of goodness and love, man shall let death have no sovereignty over his thoughts. Order and simplification are the first steps towards mastery of a subject. Marasha of the ready laugh, the orange-scented handkerchief, the bosom fair to outward eye. And life? Life itself? Was it perhaps only an infection, a sickening of matter? Was that which one might call the original procreation of matter only a disease, a growth produced by morbid stimulation of the immaterial? The first step toward evil, toward desire and death, was taken precisely then, when there took place that first increase in the density of the spiritual, that pathologically luxuriant morbid growth, produced by the irritant of some unknown infiltration, this, in part pleasurable, in part emotion of self-defense, was the primeval stage of matter, the transition from the insubstantial to the substance. This was the fall. 
Nothing is more curious and awkward than the relationship of two people who only know each other with their eyes, who meet and observe each other daily, even hourly, and who keep up the impression of disinterest either because of morals or because of a mental abnormality. Between them there is listlessness and pent-up curiosity, the hysteria of an unsatisfied, unnaturally suppressed need for communion and also a kind of tense respect. Because man loves and honors man as long as he is not able to judge him, and desire is a product of lacking knowledge. In books we never find anything but ourselves. Strangely enough, that always gives us great pleasure, and we say the author is a genius. Whoever is unable to stand up for an ideal with his person, his arm, his blood, is unworthy of that ideal, and no matter how intellectual one may become, what matters is that one remains a man. Don't you like the sight of a coffin? I really do. I find it a handsome piece of furniture, even empty, when someone is lying in it, then, in my eyes, it is positively sublime. Funerals have something very edifying. I always think one ought to go to a funeral instead of to church when one feels the need of being uplifted. People have on good black clothes, and they take off their hats and look at the coffin, and behave serious and reverent, and nobody dares to make a bad joke, the way they do in ordinary life. It's good for people to be serious, once in a way. I've sometimes asked myself if I ought not to have become a clergyman in a certain way it wouldn't have suited me so badly. According to the outline Settembrini presented, two principles were locked in combat for the world, might and right, tyranny and freedom, superstition and knowledge, the law of obduracy and the law of ferment, change, and progress. One could call the first the Asiatic principle, the other the European, for Europe was the continent of rebellion, critique, and transforming action, whereas the continent to the east embodied inertia and inactivity. There was no doubt which of these two forces would gain the victory, that of enlightenment, of recent advancement toward perfection. To allow only the kind of art that the average man understands is the worst small-mindedness and the murder of mind and spirit. It is my conviction that the intellect can be certain that in doing what most disconcerts the crowd, in pursuing the most daring, unconventional advances and explorations, it will in some highly indirect fashion serve man, and in the long run, all men. Cases of typhoid take the following course. When the fever is at its height, life calls out to the patient, calls out to him as he wanders in his distant dream, and summons him in no uncertain voice. The harsh, imperious call reaches the spirit on that remote path that leads into the shadows, the coolness and peace. He hears the call of life, the clear, fresh, mocking summons to return to that distant scene which he had already left so far behind him and already forgotten. And there may well up in him something like a feeling of shame for a neglected duty, a sense of renewed energy, courage, and hope, he may recognize a bond existing still between him and that stirring, colorful, callous existence which he thought he had left so far behind him. Then, how far he may have wandered on his distant path, he will turn back and live. But if he shudders when he hears life's voice, if the memory of that vanished scene and the sound of that lusty summons make him shake his head, Make him put out his hand to ward off as he flies forward in the way of escape that is open to him then it is clear that the patient will die. His games have a deeper meaning and fascination that adults can no longer fathom and require nothing more than three pebbles or a piece of wood with a dandelion helmet, perhaps, but above all they require only the pure, strong, passionate, chaste, still untroubled fantasy of those happy years when life still hesitates to touch us, when neither duty nor guilt dares lay a hand upon us, when we are allowed to see, hear, laugh, wonder, 
and dream without the world's demanding anything in return. When the impatience of those whom we want so much to love has not yet begun to torment us for evidence, some early token, that we will diligently fulfill our duties. Ah, it will not be long, and all that will rain down upon us in overwhelming, raw power, will assault us, stretch us, cramp us, thrill us, corrupt us. Truth and the freedom to seek it are not luxury products which enervate a people and unfit them for the struggle of life. They belong to life. They are life's daily bread. Opinions cannot survive if one has no chance to fight for them. One certainly does work badly in spring. And why? Because one's feelings are being stimulated. And only amateurs think that a creative artist can afford to have feelings. It's a naive amateur illusion. Any genuine honest artist will smile at it. Sadly, perhaps, but he will smile. Because, of course, what one says must never be one's main concern. It must merely be the raw material, quite indifferent in itself, out of which the work of art is made, and the act of making must be again aloof and detached, performed in tranquility. If you attach too much importance to what you have to say, if it means too much to you emotionally, then you may be certain that your work will be a complete fiasco. You will become solemn, you will become sentimental, you will produce something clumsy, ponderous, pompous, ungainly, unironical, insipid, dreary and commonplace, it will be of no interest to anyone, and you yourself will end up disillusioned and miserable. For that is how it is, Lisavita, emotion, warm, heartfelt emotion, is invariably commonplace and unserviceable, only the stimulation of our corrupted nervous system, its cold ecstasies and acrobatics, can bring forth art. One simply has to be something inhuman, something standing outside humanity, strangely remote and detached from its concerns, if one is to have the ability or indeed even the desire to play this game with it, to play with men's lives, to portray them effectively and tastefully. Our stylistic and formal talent, our gift of expression, itself presupposes this cold-blooded, fastidious attitude to mankind, indeed it presupposes a certain human impoverishment and stagnation. For the fact is, all healthy emotion, all strong emotion lacks taste. As soon as an artist becomes human and begins to feel, he is finished as an artist. We are most likely to get angry and excited in our opposition to some idea when we ourselves are not quite certain of our own position and are inwardly tempted to take the other side. a secret and ardent stirring within the frozen chastity of the universal. Let's put it this way, an object created by the human spirit and intellect, which means a significant object, is significant in that it points beyond itself, is an expression and exponent of a more universal spirit and intellect, of a whole world of feelings and ideas that have found a more or less perfect image of themselves in that object by which the degree of its significance is then measured. Moreover, love for such an object is itself equally significant. It says something about the person who feels it, it defines his relationship to the universe, to the world represented by the created object, and whether consciously or unconsciously, loved along with it. By now, his morality coincided with his curiosity, probably always had. 
It was the unconditional curiosity of the tourist thirsty for knowledge, a curiosity that, in having tasted the mystery of personality, had perhaps not been all that far from realms emerging here, a curiosity that displayed something of a military character by not trying to evade something forbidden if it might offer itself. A noble and active mind blunts itself against nothing so quickly as the sharp and bitter irritant of knowledge. And certain it is that the youth's constancy of purpose, no matter how painfully conscientious, was shallow beside the mature resolution of the master of his craft, who made a right about face, turned his back on the realm of knowledge, and passed it by with averted face, lest it lame his wool or power of action, paralysis his feelings or his passions, deprive any of these of their conviction or utility. A human being lives out not only his personal life as an individual, but also, consciously or subconsciously, the lives of his epoch and his contemporaries. Solitude gives birth to the original in us, to beauty unfamiliar and perilous to poetry. But also, it gives birth to the opposite, to the perverse, the illicit, the absurd. His love of the sea had profound roots, the hard-working artist's desire to rest, his longing to get away from the demanding diversity of phenomena and take shelter in the bosom of simplicity and immensity, a forbidden penchant that was entirely antithetical to his mission and, for that very reason, seductive a proclivity for the unorganized, the immeasurable, the eternal, for nothingness. The only religious way in which to regard death is to perceive and reel it as a constituent part of life, as life's holy prerequisite, and not to separate it intellectually, to set it up in opposition to life, or, worse, to play it off against life in some disgusting fashion for that is indeed the antithesis of a healthy, noble, reasonable, and religious view. The ancients decorated their sarcophagi with symbols of life and procreation, some of them even obscene. For the ancients, in fact, the sacred and the obscene were very often one and the same. Those people knew how to honor death. Death is to be honored as the cradle of life, the womb of renewal. Once separated from life, it becomes grotesque, a wraith, or even worse. For as an independent spiritual power, death is a very depraved force, whose wicked attractions are very strong and without doubt can cause the most abominable confusion of the human mind. These gentlemen had no idea what a huge joke all our doctor degrees, our whole Mandarin educational system, was to the masses, how they ridiculed our public grammar schools, that instrument of the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, maintained under the delusion that by watering down scholarship one educated the common folk. The masses had long since learned that for the education and discipline needed in the battle against the decaying bourgeoisie they should look elsewhere than to coercive schools imposed by the authorities, and by now every idiot knew that the school system developed from the cloisters of the Middle Ages was as anachronistic and absurd as a periwig, that no one owed his real education to schools anymore, and that free, open instruction by public lectures, exhibitions, films, and so forth was far superior to that found in any schoolroom. Who then was the orthodox? Who the free thinker? Where lay the true position, the true state of man? Should he descend into the all-consuming, all-equalizing chaos, that ascetic libertine state, or should he take his stand on the critical subjective, where empty bombast and a bourgeois strictness of morals contradicted each other?
Ah, the principles and points of view constantly did that. It became so hard for Hans Kastorp's civilian responsibility to distinguish between opposed positions, or even to keep the premises apart from each other and clear in his mind, that the temptation grew well-nigh irresistible to plunge head-foremost into Naphtha's morally chaotic all. But he immediately felt he did not really want to take that step. It would lead him back, give his soul back to himself, but when one is frantic, the last thing one desires is to be oneself again. Death is to be honored as the cradle of life, the womb of renewal. Once separated from life, it becomes grotesque, a wraith, or even worse. For as an independent spiritual power, death is a very depraved force, whose wicked attractions are very strong and without doubt can cause the most abominable confusion of the human mind. Her smile and voice suggested the kind of excitement that comes when the first words in a long, silent relationship are spoken at last, a subtle excitement secretly incorporating into this one moment everything that has happened until now. Is not the pastness of the past the more profound, the more legendary, the more immediately it falls before the present? I tell them that if they will occupy themselves with the study of mathematics, they will find in it the best remedy against the lusts of the flesh. Ashenbach noticed with astonishment the lad's perfect beauty. His face recalled the noblest moment of Greek sculpture, pale, with a sweet reserve, with clustering honey-colored ringlets, the brow and nose descending in one line, the winning mouth, the expression of pure and godlike serenity. Yet with all this chaste perfection of form it was of such unique personal charm that the observer, though he had never seen, either in nature or art, anything so utterly happy and consummate. I dreamed about the nature of man, and about a courteous, reasonable, and respectable community of men while the ghastly bloody feast went on in the temple behind them. Were they courteous and charming to one another, those sunny folk, out of silent regard for that horror? Even in a personal sense, after all, art is an intensified life. By art one is more deeply satisfied and more rapidly used up. It engraves on the countenance of its servants the traces of imaginary and intellectual adventures, and even if he has outwardly existed in cloistral tranquility, it leads in the long term to over-fastidiousness, over-refinement, nervous fatigue, and overstimulation, such as can seldom result from a life of the most extravagant passions and pleasures. If they were living, they must be organic, since life depended upon organization. But if they were organized, then they could not be elementary, since an organism is not single but multiple. They were units within the organic unit of the cell they built up. But if they were, then, however impossibly small they were, they must themselves be built up, organically built up, as a law of their existence, for the conception of a living unit meant by definition that it was built up out of smaller units which were subordinate, that is, organized with reference to a higher form. As long as division yielded organic units possessing the properties of life assimilation and reproduction, no limits were set to it. As long as one spoke of living units, one could not correctly speak of elementary units, for the concept of unity carried with it in perpetuity the concept of subordinated, upbuilding unity, and there was no such thing as elementary life, 
in the sense of something that was already life, and yet elementary. Passionate, that means to live for the sake of living. But one knows that you all live for sake of experience. Passion, that is self-forgetfulness. But what you all want is self-enrichment. The ladies Buddenbrook from Brightstrasse did not weep. However, it was not their custom. Their faces, a little less caustic than usual at least, expressed a gentle satisfaction at death's impartiality. All the propaganda carried on today by the prophets of nature, the experiments in regeneration, the uncooked food, fresh air cures, sunbathing, and so on, the whole Rousseauian paraphernalia had as its goal nothing but the dehumanization, the animalizing of man. He completely lacked any ardent interest that might have occupied his mind. His interior life was impoverished, had undergone a deterioration so severe that it was like the almost constant burden of some vague grief. And bound up with it all was an implacable sense of personal duty and the grim determination to present himself at his best, to conceal his frailties by any means possible, and to keep up appearances. It had all contributed to making his existence what it was, artificial, self-conscious, and forced until every word, every gesture, the slightest deed in the presence of others had become a taxing and grueling part in a play. These artists pay little attention to an encircling present that bears no direct relation to the world of work in which they live, and they therefore see in it nothing more than an indifferent framework for life either more or less favorable to production. Only love, and not reason, yields kind thoughts. Insults must be done with intention, or they are not insults.